right. Oh, GDC, the Narrative Summit is the best part of the GDC. <laughs> and the GDC is the best part of the year. I'm so excited to be here. My 23rd GDC. Okay, so today um, I was going to give a talk about the nature of order in game narrative. And to understand what that means, I need to take you into the future. Five years forward, ten years forward, no, to the year 2500. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to the year 2500, and we're going to look back. We're going to look way, way back, all the way to the 20th century. And I'll ask you the question, who will be remembered from the 20th century in the year 2500? I'm going to make the argument that the two people who will be most remembered from the 20th century in the year 2500, first will be Albert Einstein, who redefined the way we think about the relationship between space and time. And the second person that will be most remembered will be Christopher Alexander, who redefines how we think about the relationship between space and mind. Now, I know a lot of people are thinking, Shell, what are you talking about? How can it be that one of the most remembered people is someone who I've never even heard of? And I say, well, it's not uncommon, right? Like, look at all of these people. None of them were appreciated when they were alive. All of them died in obscurity, many of them in poverty. So why would we think that there aren't people among us now who are going to be celebrated long after us because we're unable to appreciate the gifts that they brought us while they were here. And I think that Christopher Alexander is one of those people. Um, the first time I found out about Christopher Alexander was when I was working at Disney. As you can imagine, Disney Imagineering has a fabulous library called the IRC. And I made it very much my habit to go to the IRC all the time. Every Monday, I would go and take out a new book. I would always just get some new book. And one time, I happened to see this weird little book on a shelf, The Timeless Way of Building. And I thought, I wonder what that means. I don't understand what that is. And I opened it up to a random page, and I find these words. Each one of us has, somewhere in his heart, the dream to make a living world a universe. And I thought, yes, 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 <laughs> yes, exactly right. Yes, this and nothing but this, right? And so I eagerly took this book home to see what it was and started reading it. And so I'll read to you from a little of it right now. There is one timeless way of building. It is thousands of years old and the same today as it has always been. The great traditional buildings of the past, the villages and tents and temples in which man feels at home, have always been made by people who were very close to the center of this way. It is not possible to make great buildings or great towns, beautiful places, places where you feel yourself, places where you feel alive, except by following this way. And as you will see, this way will lead anyone who looks for it to buildings which are themselves as ancient in their form as the trees and hills and as our faces are. It is so powerful and fundamental that with its help, you can make any building in the world as beautiful as any place that you have ever seen. So that's a powerful claim. And so how do we get there? What is the timeless way of building? Well, Alexander's idea is that the way that we look at space, um, the wisest way to look at it is with our hearts. And the idea being that things that are wonderful and beautiful, be they places or spaces or objects or experiences, they have certain wonderful feelings. And he refers to the quality of these things that are good and right and just you know it, this is how things should be. He refers to this quality as the quality without a name. 
Now, the quality may not have a name, but it does have certain aspects. So let's talk about the aspects that he, uh, that, that he says this quality has. So he talks about things and places that feel right as feeling alive and having a living quality to them. Now, I know I experienced this when I played Ultima online. I played that game quite a bit, and the place I used to hang out was the town of U. Uh, U is just kind of a small town, kind of in the north. And you see there's a map of the town there from above. You can see up there, there's a, there's a castle up there, and uh, um, there's, there's, there's a, a town center, and there's some things out on an island. There's a bunch of things there. But in truth, there were only a small fraction of this place felt alive. I'll show you where. Those yellow lines, anything on those yellow lines felt alive. Everything else felt dead and useless. OK? Now, you see that part where there's sort of a little lumpy star at the top? That was where the bank was. That was where you stored all your objects. You had to store your objects there. And you see that big fan of yellow lines at the top? That was where the monsters were. You would go up and fight monsters, and then you would return back to this little town and put things in the bank. So there was this constant flow of people back and forth. Now, what about those other two lines, that one to the right? That went to a teleport gate, which, of course, could take you anywhere in the world, which was really useful. And then the line going down south was for people who wanted to take the long walk and go and visit other towns. No one ever went anywhere else. No one went to the town square. No one went to the island. No one went to the other places. But those, this little network of things felt totally alive. And most particularly, that junction, that kind of southern junction where those lines came together. If you wanted to just hang out and see people come and go and know what was going on, you would hang out there. And it felt wonderful. And it felt alive. So another property that he talks about is things feeling whole. Apologize for the seam down the middle here. I scanned this right out of the book. Places that, so there are sometimes places that feel whole. They feel like they don't need anything else. They have everything that they need. Other times, things feel comfortable. And I like the way Alexander talks about the, the, the idea of comfort. The word comfortable is more profound than people usually realize. The mystery of genuine comfort goes far beyond the simple idea that the word first seems to mean. Places which are comfortable are comfortable because they have no inner contradictions, because there is no little restlessness disturbing them. Imagine yourself on a winter afternoon with a pot of tea, a book, a reading light, and two or three large pillows to lean back against. Now make yourself comfortable. Not in some way which you can show to other people and say how much you like it. I mean so that you really like it for yourself. You put the tea where you can reach it, but in a place where you can't possibly knock it over. You pull the light down to shine on the book, but not too brightly, and so that you can't see the naked bulb. You put the cushions behind you and place them carefully, one by one, just where you want them, to support your back, your neck, your arm, so that you are supported just comfortably, just as you want to sip your tea and read and dream. When you take the trouble to do all that and you do it carefully, with much attention, then it may begin to have the quality which has no name. So he also talks about things feeling free. Um, so that they could be anything that they wanted to. But at the same time, these things have a feeling of exactness, that they are just so, that if you change them even just a little bit, that might ruin them. They're also egoless. They're not about someone showing off. They're not about someone saying, hey, look how amazing I am. They just are for themselves and for the people who use them. And then very importantly, he talks about them having an eternal quality. And I really like the way that he describes this. I once saw a simple fish pond in a Japanese village which was perhaps eternal. A farmer made it for his farm. The pond was a simple rectangle, about six feet wide and eight feet long, opening off a little irrigation stream. At the end, a bush of flowers hung over the water. At the other end, under the water, was a circle of wood, its top perhaps 12 inches below the surface of the water. In the pond were eight great ancient carp, each maybe 18 inches long, orange, gold, purple, and black. The oldest one had been there 80 years. 
The eight fish swam slowly, slowly in circles, often within the wooden circle. The whole world was within that pond. Every day the farmer sat by it for a few minutes. I was there only one day, and I sat by it all afternoon. Even now, I cannot think of it without tears. Those ancient fish had been swimming slowly in that pond for 80 years. It was so true to the nature of the fish and the flowers and the water and the farmers that it had sustained itself for all that time, endlessly repeating, always different. There is no degree of wholeness or reality which can be reached beyond that simple pond. And of course, we all want to make things that last. Things that last are the things that are good and have the right qualities. Um, so how do we get to all of these qualities? And that's what the Timeless Way book is about. And the Timeless Way is a simple idea. All, it, all you do is you do what feels right, and you test it and you change it until all imperfection is gone. So here's an example where he talks about building a lab. Suppose you have built a small laboratory building. It has a kitchen, a library, four labs, and a main entrance. You want to add a fifth laboratory to it because you need more space. Don't look for the best place right away. First, look at the existing building and see what's wrong with it. There is a path where tin cans collect, a tree which is a beautiful tree, but somehow no one uses it. One of the four labs is always empty. There's nothing obviously wrong with it, but somehow no one ever goes there. The main entrance has no places to sit comfortably. The earth around one corner of the building is being eroded. Now look at all these things which are wrong and build the fifth lab in such a way that it takes care of all these problems and also does for itself what it will have to do, right? So what he's really saying here, the, the fundamental idea is this is playtesting and agile development. One of the things Alexander's famous for, he often built campuses, college campuses and the thing, and we've all seen situations like this on campuses, right? The architect did not understand where people really wanted to go when they built this. And so Alexander's method was, no, I'm not going to lay down sidewalks. I'm just going to leave it all grass, and I will see, I'll come back two years later, I'll see where everyone did walk, and then I'll pave that, right? And that's the notion of the timeless way of building. You, you come up with an idea for what feels right, you see how people use it, and then you adjust, and you make it, you make it work. Part of what he recommends, for example, it sounds sort of crazy, but building buildings out of cardboard, probably doesn't sound crazy to Sean Patton, but uh, uh, building actual buildings uh, out of cardboard, so partly so that you can see where the sun is going to fall into the buildings, and then once you, you feel good about your cardboard one, then, only then, build a real building. So there's a companion volume with the timeless way of building, which is much better known. It's a book called The Pattern Language. Because after having established the right process for creating living places, Alexander got together with a bunch of people and said, all right, let's talk about, let's see if we can enumerate the architectural patterns that actually feel alive and feel like they have these qualities. So how many of these are there? Are there 10? Are there 15? No, there's 253. And I've enumerated them all here for you. Um, we won't have time to go through them all, uh, but so we'll, we'll talk about some of them. So he starts out with big patterns, like pattern four is agricultural valleys, right? Um, th that we need those in order to, to live in a healthy society. A mosaic of subcultures, so talking about the way different things interconnect within a city. Neighborhoods having boundaries being an important pattern. That neighborhoods that just blend, flow into each other with no boundary, are, they have, that's a certain problem. Then the patterns start to get a little more intimate. Pattern 68, connected play. There needs to be a way for kids to get together to play. I like his comment here. If children don't play enough with other children during the first five years of life, there is a great chance that they will have some kind of mental illness later in their lives. And what better cure for that than pattern 73, adventure playground. Yes, that's a good one. He, talks about, uh, he starts talking about buildings. I like this idea, courtyards which live. And I love his counterexample here. 
The courtyards built in modern buildings are very often dead. They are intended to be private open spaces for people to use, but they end up unused, full of gravel and abstract sculptures. But then he gives examples of courtyards that feel really alive, and he does an analysis of what is it. And he points out it's not money. It's not that these are expensive places. But it has to do with the way people flow through them, the views in and out of them. Is it comfortable to, to sit there and to be there? Is this a nexus of where there are things to look at? Are there natural elements as well as man-made elements here? Here's a pattern that should be near and dear to the heart of any game designer, paths and goals. And you'll, you'll see he has this little uh, fountain. When you're talking about paths, that seems strange. But what he points out is that it is a bad path that doesn't give you a goal that you're moving toward. And that good path design has a series of little landmarks where you're looking forward to getting to this one, and then getting to that one, and getting to the next one. Because that's the nature of walking. As he says, the process of walking is far more subtle than one might imagine. And of course, we do this in games all the time. But why not do this? in the real world. Light on two sides of every room. It's just something that we feel better about. Another one, ceiling height variety. When all ceilings are the same height, it has a bad feeling for us. When they change, it has a good feeling. And then finally, he wraps it up on page 1064 <laughs> with pattern 253, the most, infinite, the most intimate of all, things from your life. So this book was very influential. It caused a big stir in the architecture world. Some people liked it. Some people didn't like it. Um, but many people outside the architecture world were influenced by it. If you've ever heard of the idea of software design patterns, the people who started that movement were very much influenced by Alexander's book, A Pattern Language. And I have to say, I don't think I would have written Art of Game Design with my lenses approach of 100 lenses if I had not read Pattern Language. It, it definitely showed me that that was a good way to do it. In fact, I got double benefit, because at the time I was reading Pattern Language, I was wrestling with how to lay out the map for Toontown Online. And after I read it, I'm like, oh, OK, paths, neighborhoods with boundaries, central hubs. And like I just understood how you make a good neighborhood. And I wasn't the only one. Will Wright read Pattern Language, and he made SimCity very much. He talks about how he was inspired by Pattern Language to make SimCity. And if you play The Sims and you use patterns from the book, if you put lights on two sides of a room, the characters are happier. He like programmed the patterns right into the game. Now, a lot of people have read and know pattern language, and that's usually all most people know about Christopher Alexander. But I contend that that was far from his greatest work. So he did that stuff back in the 70s. And he was not satisfied with what he'd found there. Um, he, he, he felt good about these patterns, but he wanted to break it down and get to something more fundamental. And so later, he wrote these other books, this series of four books which are called The Nature of Order. He wanted to break things down into more fundamental components. And he wanted to truly understand the quality that has no name. And in these later books, he gets bolder, and he gives it a name. And he says that quality is life. And he argues that life isn't what we think it is. We think of just living things, organic things, as, as what life is. And he argues that life is something more fundamental to the universe than that. Life as we know it has those properties. That's why it persists. That why, that's why it stays. But that's not the only kind of life in the universe. His big revelation is that what makes things stay are things that have centers. And that anything that has structure and persists and stays is a series of overlapping centers. Now, that's a deep idea and kind of hard to grasp. And what he does is he breaks it down to a series of 15 patterns that create these centers. So he breaks it down to these 15 properties. And he argues that anything in the universe that stays and persists has these 15 properties. Every building, every tool we create, but also things in nature. Living things have these properties, but also other things. Atoms and molecules all have these properties. The structure of galaxies and the structure of star systems has these properties. Everything, everything, everything has these properties. And not to get too weird about it, but he kind of starts to come to this conclusion that these properties are more fundamental than the universe itself because no universe can exist that doesn't have these properties. So this is a deep idea. 
Um, but we're not going to dwell on that deep idea. What we're going to do today is we're going to go through the 15 properties, and we're going to look at the question of how can these properties help us when we're trying to construct game narratives? All right. So the first one is this idea of levels of scale. And what he's talking about is that great things are not just great at a single level. They're usually great at multiple levels. They have multiple things interacting, like this interesting kind of architectural porch here that has beautiful big elements, beautiful me medium-sized elements, and beautiful tiny elements. And of course, levels of scale, like that goes all through nature, right? Look at lightning bolts. They're incredibly fractal. They have the same structure up the top, and then they have tiny ones, and tiny, and tiny, and tiny. And that's how so many things in nature work. They work nature works at levels of scale. And in terms of creating beautiful things, I often think about what John Hench said. He was uh, one of the old Imagineers and old Disney animators. And he would talk about how anyone can make something that's beautiful from far away. That's easy to do. You can make a big castle or something that looks beautiful from far away, but so often you get close and you're like, oh, is that what it is? And that's part of the reason if you go to Cinderella Castle at Disney World and you go as close as you can, you will find there are these beautiful mosaics that are inlaid over many of the interior surfaces. And no matter how close you get, you see how gorgeous and beautiful they are. And in fact, if you look, even at the top, the little, the little uh, points of the towers are actually made out of solid gold. Um, because they really were committed to this notion of making things beautiful close up and far away. Now, in games, we use levels of scale all the time because it feels good. It feels good to kind of move from big and into small. And sometimes we use it in ways that are very, very powerful, this idea of kind of comparing levels of scale. The game Spore was a symphony of levels of scale. And it was one of the things that was so exciting and so appealing about it. But you don't need to get into these giant universe-sized levels of scale to do interesting things. Part of the reason Pac-Man works so well is because it has good levels of scale. You, you, your immediate goal is get the dots, and the dots are little. And then you have this other goal sometimes to get ghosts, and ghosts are kind of a big deal, and eating a ghost is kind of a big thing. And then your bigger goal is clear a board, and that's like a big part of it. If the game didn't have all three of these levels of scale, it would feel sort of dull. If you were just doing one of those things, it would feel sort of dull, but the fact that you have these goals at three levels makes it much more interesting. And when it comes to story, of course, we have some of the same thing. You, you have plot, and plot is like a big structure, and that's your big structure for any story you put together. And then medium, you have characters. Right? Characters are kind of at the medium level of narrative design. And then at the small level of, of narrative design, you have your fabulous dialogue. Right? Um, and if all three of these things are not excellent, if like John Hench was talking about, you have a beautiful plot, but boring characters and dull dialogue, everything stinks. Right? But if you're great at all three of these levels, you have something that's really solid and really wonderful. So the second pattern is the idea of strong centers. Now that seems a little self-referential because if the whole idea is we're defining what centers are, then how is strong centers a pattern? And what he's just talking about is that the stronger the centers are, the better things get. And I like this example of a plaza here. Imagine the plaza without that utmost tower, the, like the, the, north, the top tower there. It would not be as strong. It would not be as interesting. There are different things that like multiply. The, the multiple patterns come together and make centers much stronger than they, than they would be on their own. And of course, we see this all through nature. right? We see it on star systems are all about strong centers. You've got these suns at the center. If you look at, uh, you look down at the microscopic level at the way uh, atoms are formed, like and the way molecules come together, you'll see again these really strong centers, the nucleus of each atom. We see it in video games all the time. Yeah, Star Castle. Those are some strong centers right there. That dude does not want you knocking on his door, man. He doesn't, but if you're good, you can kind of get in there. Get in there, get, uh, no, come on, get in there. Yes, right? Strong centers, that's part of what makes PUBG work. Right? 
If PUBG was just an island and you ran around, like who would care? But what happens is there is a secret center and you don't know where it is and the whole world is shrinking down to the secret center and if you're not near the center, you're gonna die. It's gonna kill you. And where is the center? Where is the center? And that's what everybody wants to know. And people get very emotional about that. They end up having very strong feelings about the centers in, in, in PUBG, but we won't, we won't dwell on that. One thing I often think about is choose your own adventure type stories and how as a genre of writing, it never really sticks that well. In the literary world, every few years, someone will say, hey, here's some new choose your own adventures and they'll kind of be a thing for kids. But if you like go to Barnes and Noble, there's not like a choose your own adventure section because it's just not a genre that stays. And I think part of the problem is where are the strong centers? They're just not here. Choose your own adventure structure is a big, gangly, floppy thing with no real strong center. And that makes it hard to uh, enjoy. So I found again and again the idea of finding out what are the centers of my game. Because now you have to ask the question, if strong centers are important, what are the centers of my game? So we're working on a game at Shell Games right now um, all about a virtual chemistry lab. And originally it was called Super Chem, and we started trying to figure out, all right, what are the centers of this? We knew that our central mechanic was realistic manipulation of laboratory equipment. We knew that that was, that was central. If we didn't get that right, we were in trouble. This is meant to be an educational game, so it has a transformational goal of teaching real lab skills. So if we don't get that right, that's a problem. So these two things we know are centers. But then this could be boring, right? This could end up being like a really boring thing if we don't do it right. So we knew a central aspect was that we needed a strong fantasy. And we knew that a lot of people have a fantasy of I'm the lab genius, I'm the mad scientist in the lab. So we changed it from super chem to now it's called hollow lab champions, right? And it's all about being the greatest lab worker in the world. And um, we found that these three things together, by focusing on these as the center, things are starting to come together with that game. So another pattern, pattern number three, property number three is boundaries. Boundaries, uh, as Alexander puts it, they draw attention to the center. Boundaries create centers. And right here you see a map of a cathedral here, and you see how important the boundaries are in terms of creating centers. Here's some boundaries in nature. Look at the, the here's a cutaway of us, some, some wood cells, right? Nature is all about the boundaries. All living things are made out of cells, and cells have boundaries all over the place. Check out this door. It's kind of a cool door. Looks pretty cool. I'd, I'd be like, yes, I might go in that door. How about now? Yeah, right? Look at all those boundaries. Boundaries make things important. Boundary, 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 boundary. You'll find the fancier any picture is, the more boundaries it has on the frame going around it. Because there's something about boundaries that creates strong centers, makes things important. Now, in game design, we know all about boundaries. So many games are all about boundaries and boundary lines and cross this line and cross that line and, and complete this goal and complete that goal. We're all about boundaries in game design. But what about in our narrative design? Are there boundaries there? Well, they show up in surprising places. If you talk about the hero's journey, the obvious place they show up there is with thresholds, right? Those moments where you cross and you can't come back. That's really important. If you don't have good thresholds in your story design, then you don't have good story. You've got to have those clear boundaries. And the most interesting stories are usually the ones that pit two systems against each other with conflicting boundaries. And you have to make a choice about which boundaries you're going to respect and which boundaries you're going to violate. Because that ends up being exciting. This was part of the idea in Bioshock with the little sisters, right? You've got one system that says you want to get as many points as possible. Well, guess what? In order to get as many points as possible, you're going to need to murder a bunch of little girls. Or you can rescue the little girls, but you only get half as many points. So now your normal sense of decency and its boundaries are put up against the boundaries of winning at the game. Similarly, Papers, Please is a game that establishes all these rules. Here's your job. This is what you do. You need to obey the rules in a certain way. And then it puts you in situations where you, your, again, your sense of human decency is like maybe violating the rules is the right thing in this case. So the system of rules and the system of what's right come into conflict. So I often find that creating the best, most interesting stories is about boundaries in conflict with each other. So now a surprising pattern, alternating repetition. 
And you can see it illustrated here in the, the classical egg dart pattern, which you can see in buildings all over the place uh, outside. This is a pattern that's been around thousands of years, will not go away, because we like alternating repetition so much. But wait, rep isn't repetition boring? Well, repetition can be boring. When it's just straight repetition, it's boring and bad and has a bad feeling. But when it's alternating repetition, we love it. So consider the checkerboard. We don't have to make checkerboards like this. We could have made it a piece of graph paper, but we don't like a piece of graph paper. We like alternating repetition. We could have made it a rainbow of squares, a bunch of different colors, all different colors. No, 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 no. Alternating repetition is what we like as humans. And we see this everywhere. Everybody knows, you know, anyone here is going to know about the flow channel, keeping your game kind of on that, on that wonderful place between boredom and anxiety, in that wonderful state of flow, and you increase your flow over time. But of course, we all know that's not really the right way to do it. That's the right way to do it, right? You get a little bored because it's a little too easy, and oh my god, it got so hard, and now, ooh, I get a little bit of a break. You get a tension and then a release, a tension and then a release. That's a pattern that we like. And of course, you see this in games like Flame and the Flood, right? You have these horrible, intense experiences on the islands, and now ah, I'm back on the river, and it's OK, and I can relax, and all right, I'm getting ready. I'm relaxed enough. It's actually getting a little boring here on the river. I'm going to go back on the island, and it's going to get exciting again. And even in one of the most classic patterns of game narrative, the string of pearls or the rivers and lakes approach, where you have a cutscene and a level and a cutscene and a level, and as much as people sometimes deride that pattern. The reason the pattern doesn't go away is because it's wonderful alternating repetition. We like to kind of take a break and sort of see what's going on and get set up for the next thing and then get all active and then take a break, right? So it's alternating repetition. It feels, feels really good. The fifth pattern took me a while to understand. The pattern he calls positive space. And what's weird about it is what he's saying is that Things that are well designed don't just have a good shape unto themselves, like this. here's this ancient bowl that has kind of a cool shape, but also the negative space around them also has a good shape. So if you look at the shape around the bowl, it actually is kind of a cool, pleasing shape. As a counterexample, here's a, here's a sculpture that's just kind of, you know, modern sculpture right there, and it's kind of a cool shape by itself, but the space around it doesn't really have much of a shape and as a result, the thing is just kind of a little bit blah. So we see this spatially in games all the time, right? There's a Monument Valley level right there, and you see it's got a cool shape all by itself, but also look at the negative space around it. Those are good, interesting shapes. But what does this mean in the world of narrative? What does positive and negative space mean in narrative? And I think, I sometimes think it's, the right way to think about it is positive space can be dialogue, is a kind of positive space. So what is that negative space then? Well, it's either silence or someone else's dialogue, right? And this is illustrated incredibly well in Oxenfree, if people have played this. This is so masterfully created, because like a lot of games, you make these little choices. Here are your different text choices. Lots of games have this. But what's so artfully done in Oxenfree is you don't have to pick one of the choices. Silence is an option, and then something else will happen. And so if you want to, you can be silent. And then more than just silence being an option, when you pick these is up to you. It's not like someone talks and then they wait, like normal games. In Oxenfree, the, the dialogue options come up while someone else is talking, and you can interrupt them at any time. And sometimes interrupting them is fine and the right thing to do. Sometimes it's incredibly insulting, and other times, um, saying anything at all is a bad idea because someone is saying something very important. And you want to say something, but actually restraining yourself and letting the other person talk is the better choice. So it's more natural. It's more like things are in the real world. And again, it has this idea of positive and negative space in dialogue. Another pattern is the idea of good shape. He makes the simple observation that things that are well-constructed and meet their own purposes and do so well and, and help everyone out, they tend to take on shapes that are just beautiful by themselves. And so in some ways, good shape is kind of a signifier that, yeah, you probably did this right. Like, look at this um, boat sail, right? Man, that just looks so strong and so 
powerful. And of course, it wasn't designed to be beautiful. It was designed to maximize its ability to move the boat. Now, we have good shapes in games all the time, right? There's a little, it's a little bit of Legend of Zelda shape right there. Here's one I like, a classic phoenix, right? That's kind of a cool shape on that big boss monster. This, I believe, is the first boss monster in the history of gaming, is uh, that guy in Phoenix. But sort of what's so cool about this as a shape, it's not just designed to be pretty, it's functional. The whole idea is you're going to shoot holes in all that orange mass underneath because you've got to shoot that purple guy in the middle. And, of course, he's really hard to shoot because there's all the, you've got to clear this big tunnel because there's so much stuff around him. But the secret strategy is that purple ribbon under him is a rotating ribbon, and you need to shoot holes in that. But what you can do is move over to the side, shoot along the side, and like get holes in the ribbon, and like get the ribbon all busted up, and then go back to the middle because the middle's dangerous because that dude is dropping all these things on you. So because everything's functional in the game, like this, just this good shape naturally emerges from it. And shapes can be spatial, but when, again, when you get into the world of narrative, like what, is, what do shapes, what do we mean by good shape? I think sometimes we need to think of good shape in terms of time. Having the right shape of interaction over time is important. One of the things I, I was blown away when I first played um, Oh, the interactive Walking Dead um, by a few different things. So traditionally, when we've had in interactive dialogue moments, we put them at important, mom at important times. Now, of course, that means you're respecting the story, first of all. Walking Dead didn't do that. Walking Dead said, no, the most important thing is rhythm of interaction is most important. There's a shape of interaction that we like. And we're going to give you dialogue interactions at that rhythm so it feels good, so it feels natural. But you're like, oh, but what if some of those, what if those dialogue things don't mean anything? That's OK. A lot of things we say don't mean anything. And that's OK. Now, the problem is that creates a bad ambiguity. How do I know if something I said was helpful or not helpful? And these guys had the insight to when you do something that really makes a difference, this little thing pops up that so-and-so will remember that, right? And um, personally, I feel like that was a really good shape that kind of came out of thoughtful design. So here's a surprising pattern, local symmetries. This is not an obvious idea at first. We all are always told that symmetrical things are beautiful and beauty is symmetry, et cetera, et cetera. But look at this building. That's not a very symmetrical building. But then you notice, you know, this is, this is the Alhambra here. It is full of small symmetries, little symmetrical rectangular spaces, symmetrical rotational spaces. It's a bunch of local symmetries all glued together. And this was, a, I'd never heard anyone make this observation before, that m many great, wonderful, persistent things are local symmetries all glued together. The human body is certainly this way. Our hands are a local symmetry with each other, but they're not symmetrical with our feet. And it wouldn't be better if they were, right? That wouldn't necessarily be a good thing. And certainly, look at our organs inside the body. Uh, some of them are symmetrical with each other. Others are not. Um, and then they're all kind of glued together, these very different things, with each one having its own symmetry, all kind of stuck together. Where do we see this in games? Well, here's a map of the original Zelda. I mean, look at that. It's like the map of the Alhambra. Like, it's, there's no overall symmetry, because overall symmetry isn't helpful. But look at all the local symmetries. Look at all the little local symmetries all glued together. Now, when it comes to stories, I am less clear at what relevance this has. I'm a little stumped by this, honestly. I have an instinct that it has something to do with characters. Uh, when I see a bunch of characters that are all different from each other, and they're all kind of brought together. Like, this feels like local symmetries to me. But I feel like there's something deeper with local symmetries in narrative that I don't understand yet. But let's press on. Pattern eight, deep interlock. And actually, as the way Alexander puts it, ambiguity and deep interlock. And normally, we think of ambiguity as bad. But what he's talking about is an ambiguity where you have two things interacting with each other in such a powerful way that it's hard to give attribution to either one of them. So here's some Inca stone carving, where these stones just fit together perfectly and beautifully. And which one defines the space over the other? I mean, this is the idea of the dovetail joint, 
right? Neither one is in charge. It's only because they are both perfectly, deeply interlocked that you have something that's strong and solid. We see this in games. Certainly the game of Go is all about deep interlock. There's nothing to push against in the game except the other player, and everything that one player does is defined by pushing against the other player, and each game ends up being its own kind of organism and entity, the way things are pushed together. Terence Lee talks about the idea of two kinds of stories in every game. That there is the explicit story, which is the one the designer is trying to tell, but then there is the player story, the, the story of like what the player is experiencing, the story that's happening to them. And when those line up, it feels great, and when those don't line up, it's super bad. Like maybe you've got a situation where the, you as the designer, you gave a sidekick to the character, and you're like, yeah, I've got this awesome sidekick, and I think it's great, and I think it's funny. And the player's like, I hate this guy. I totally hate this sidekick. And then you create a situation where, oh no, the sidekick fell in a well. You've got to help out the sidekick. And the player might be like, no, screw that, right? I'm so glad that guy fell in a well. Do I really have to rescue that guy? I really don't want to. That's terrible. That means everything's falling apart in your story because you don't have good, deep interlock between the player's story and the explicit story. And this is one of the, one of the first games I experienced that did this really well was uh, Planet Fall, you know, the old Steve Moretzky game here. He, he creates this beautiful sidekick, this, this character named Floyd, who's funny and cute, and you just can't help but be super entertained by, by Floyd. And so as a result, when horrible things happen to Floyd, you're like, no, you're like, it's a big deal. And I've talked to many people where this was the first time they cried during a game was in Planet Fault because these things were just so well aligned. Yes, so there's your deep interlock, see, between, yeah, okay, you got it. All right, next pattern is contrast. Okay, I love this, this bowl, and Alexander has a picture of this bowl in his book, and he, he points out how like the two opposites really make this one unity. They really bring things together, and contrast, of course, does make things stronger, but often in surprising ways. Um, Zippy the Pinhead, via Bill Griffith, once had a long expostulation about the nature of comedy, where he points out that all comedy is the unity of opposites. I'll let you think about that for a minute. Right there, the unity of opposites. But it's true, all comedy is the unity of opposites. Like this sign. <laughs> right? It's funny because these two things should not be together. Or I saw this sign in, uh, in Newcastle. <laughs> right? And that's how comedy works. And comedy is really important in our stories, right? And so understanding how to get that contrast, how to get the two opposites together and bring them together in a surprising way is important. And this brings me to Undertale, which, of course, has a lot of really wonderful, funny moments in it. But at the same time, it has a lot of really serious moments in it. So it's a weird game because it's very silly and very serious. But now I ask you the question, would Undertale be more serious if you took the funny parts out? And would it be funnier if you took the serious parts out? The answer in both cases, I think, is no. The serious parts make the funny parts funny, and the funny parts make the serious parts more serious. That is the magic of contrast. It requires a certain bravery to use it, um, but when you do, it can be used to really, really great effect. So the next one is gradients or graded variation. And this is just an observation that when things change gradually, that is sometimes beautiful. We talked about boundaries when things change suddenly. But also a gradual change can be a beautiful thing. And I had to rack my brain a bit to think about gradual changes in games. Because we often have very punctuated changes in games. Graduate, gradual changes are often more hidden and, and subtle. But one that I thought of, that I, uh, a recent game, Jason Rohrer's new game, One Hour, One Life. I don't know if people are familiar with this game, but the idea is that you log into this world and you are a baby 
you come into the world as a baby. And you're going to live one hour. But in that one hour, you're going to go from a baby to a very old person. And at the end of that hour, you're going to die. But it's a persistent world. And so the changes that you make will be permanent. And when you log in in the future as a new person, generations down the road, um, you will have a mother and father in the game, and the, the world will be persistent. And part of the power of the game is that gradual change over the course of, of an hour. So finding those right gradual changes can be important. Pattern 11 is very counterintuitive, the idea of roughness. Now, normally, we think of roughness as a bad thing. We want to smooth things out. We want to sand things. We want to polish things. We want to take away all roughness. But what he points out is that roughness often is part of what makes things great and real. I, I love his picture of this house, which in a lot of ways seems kind of like an atrocity, right? The, uh, the, 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 the lines don't line up right. It's very inconsistent. But there's a very human, peaceful quality about it. One example I think about a lot is pure vanilla extract. If you go to the grocery store, you have a choice. You can buy pure vanilla extract, or for a dollar less, imitation vanilla flavor. Now, what's the difference between these things? You think, oh, well, one comes from real vanilla. The other, I don't know, comes from some lab, whatever. It's something that, that smells like vanilla, but is in no way vanilla. And that is completely wrong. In truth, both of them contain the same thing. A bunch of vanillin molecule, C8H8O3, suspended in an alcohol solution. That's what both of these are. The only difference is where it comes from. The pure vanilla extract comes from the vanilla plant. The imitation vanilla flavor comes from a process of pouring acid on paper pulp that just happens to create this same molecule. But you're getting exactly the same thing. Well, not exactly the same thing, because the imitation stuff is actually pure. It's nothing but alcohol and vanilla molecule, whereas the pure vanilla extract is not pure. It has all this extra junk that is not vanilla that comes from the vanilla plant but is not the thing that smells like vanilla. But the reason we favor that one is because of all that junk. We like all that weird, rough junk. It makes everything feel broader and more interesting and, and more complex, right? So this is a case where purity actually gets you in trouble. Purity isn't as good. Roughness ends up being better. Who, for example, would pay to go and see the perfectly straight Tower of Pisa? Nobody would do that, right? It's, it's the roughness that makes it interesting. I once heard Peter Molyneux talk about the idea that the greatest difficulty for game artists is dirt that getting things to look dirty is so hard. And, and it's true, and it's important to make things look dirty because they give things a roughness. In, in sports, any ball that you have in a sporting game, they're not perfectly smooth. If they're ever touched by human hands, they're not perfectly smooth. It's the roughness that defines them. The roughness is how we interact with them. Think of a game like Monopoly. What is Monopoly? It's a landlord simulator. You're going to be a landlord and do landlord things. OK, awesome. What are the avatars going to be? All right, they're going to be this. What? Should, shouldn't they be that little Monopoly dude with the mustache in six different colors? Nope. There's going to be a hat and a battleship and a shoe and a dog. What are you doing? What kind of screwed up game design is this? Right? And I often think of what uh, Goethe said. All lyrical work must, as a whole, be perfectly intelligible, but in some particulars, a little unintelligible. Right? I'm sure he was thinking about Monopoly when he wrote that. If Minecraft was all beautiful, polished environments, would it be better? No. No. The roughness is important. OK, pattern 12, echoes. Echoes is an interesting idea. I, I love this little, this little uh, hut. I think it's in, in Turkey here, this little house. And you see these sort of echoes of design. Look at how the roof caps echo each other, even though they're a little different from each other. And then even the doorway has a very similar shape and angle to the roof peaks. And it kind of connects everything together. 
So Alexander often talks about making sure the angles of different things are connected, and that helps bring an overall connectedness. His counterexample is this interesting building actually created by Michelangelo. But when you look at this building, it's not really great. Like, nothing connects to anything else very well. The angles are all different. The shapes are all different. It's a little bit of a hodgepodge. There's a big overall symmetry for no good reason. And then there's these local symmetries, but nothing connects, and it just doesn't, it doesn't feel so great. So in games, we do this all the time. We did this in our Water Bears VR game. We'd had this initial tablet-based game called Water Bears, which was all about bringing colored water to these cute little water bears. And we made a VR version, and we said, wow, this is so relaxing to play this. Let's, since it's a relaxing game, let's put it in a relaxing setting. So we put it in this, this kind of Caribbean setting. Uh, it was very relaxing. It kind of echoes the nature of the gameplay. A less relaxing game, Night in the Woods, right? Um, is also full of echoes. This is a game that is all about growing up, moving from the world of childhood to the world of adulthood, and how you have to give things up in order to do that. And so in, in doing so, they, they made the characters all very cartoony, childlike characters, but they put them in very adult situations, thus kind of echoing the whole theme and sort of playing up that contrast. Another great example of echoes I like is Cuphead. Uh, Cuphead, even though it's you know, maybe not the deepest game narrative in the world, it has a really nice connection between what you do in the game and the overall story. So really, what's Cuphead about? This is a game about jumping into danger, right? So our story is that these two cup-headed brothers, they were gambling with the devil. They knew it was dangerous, right? But they jumped right in and they gambled with the devil. They lost, so they lost their souls. So what's the solution? The devil says, well, um, I've got a bunch of people I need you to collect contracts from. It's going to be super dangerous. And they're like, all right, let's go do it. And so they go and jump into danger. Uh, here's, here's an example of some danger jumping here. Right, so this game is so freaking hard. You see that little pink thing? That's actually kind of important. Boink, jumping on those pink things. So those pink things are what's in the game. It's called a parry move. Those pink things will kill you. If you just jump on them, they'll, you'll just die. But if you time it just right, right here, you can take a look. Here's some more of them. If you time it just right and you hit the jump button a second time while you're in the air, your character spins a little bit, turns pink, and then will hit the pink thing and, and like build up all these bonus uh, attacks that you can use later. If this was me doing this scene, I would have died six times by now because I would have, I would have hit the parry button at the wrong time and hit the ghost and I'd be dead. So you got a story all about characters who jump into danger, and then you have a central mechanic that is about literally jumping into danger. And you can argue that these guys took this nature of echoes a little too far, um, because you know there they are, the Moldenhauer brothers, uh, you know two brothers who who were kind of the, the who initiated this game here, and and uh, there's there's Maya, their cousin, kind of talking about it. Uh, they jumped in on a thing. They did not know what they were doing, right? I mean, here's the initial frame from the Cuphead trailer. You'll notice, coming 2015, right? You had a game, I mean, and this is the second one. The original trailer said coming 2014, right? So this game was three years late, and they never would have been able to do it if they hadn't done a deal with Microsoft, right, in order to do it. And I don't want to say Microsoft's like the devil, but, like, it's possible to take the echo thing a little too far, is all, all I'm, I'm saying right there. All right, uh, three more patterns here. One of them is the void. And this is a little bit of a strange pattern, a void where nothing is there. This picture is a picture actually from my house. Uh, when my wife and I moved into the house we live in about 15 years ago, we picked it up at, I don't know, Target or Marshalls or something. We're like, oh, this looks kind of cool. And my fascination with this picture is just never ending. Even though, what is it? It's just some leaves. But what gets me is that black square, right? Clo close one eye and put a finger up and cover the black square. And you'll see this is a completely unremarkable picture. And then you take that finger away, and you're like, black square, what are you doing there? Why are you there? And this void pattern shows up in lots of places, every church has the void pattern 
inside it because that's where important things happen. The human heart, what does it have a lot of complex structure in there? No, empty. It's empty inside there, right? The most important things are empty inside. And part of the reason that's important is because when you enter an empty space, suddenly you become very important and everything you do becomes very important. We see this in the hero's journey. There's always that moment of entering the cave, right? The cave is this kind of empty space where something very important is going to happen. We see it in video games all the time. Like, a boss monster battle never happens in a linen closet. It always happens when you come into a big empty space and you're like, oh, I think things are going to happen right now. I see a bunch of local symmetries in an empty space. And I think, oh yeah, oh yeah, something's going to happen right now. Um, so the void is, is very important. And of course, think about the void in terms of storytelling. Um, if we talk about positive and negative space being dialogue and silence, the use of silence is often very, very powerful that way. And, and um, there are m many games, uh, I think Undertale is a great example, has, have... Uh, found clever ways to sort of use silence in order to deliver power. The 14th pattern is simplicity and inner calm. The idea being that when everything unessential is stripped away and you only have what's needed, there is a certain calm quality because nothing else is needed. Everything is here, as simple as it can be, and there's a perfect quality about it. These, these pillars holding up a shrine, uh, a Japanese shrine, are, are one of Alexander's examples. And he points out that these things are not trying to be what they are. They're just usually serving an unusual purpose in the simplest way possible, and that often gives them this sort of strength and inner calm. Now, simplicity and complexity we talk about all the time in games. And it's tricky, right? Because you hear people say, oh, I hate that game, it's too complex. And you hear people say, I hate that game, it's too simple. Well, well, what does that mean? Somewhere in the middle is right? No, we know simple games are better, except when it's the bad kind of simple. What? What does that mean? Well, part of the idea is there are two kinds of complexity. One of them is innate complexity. Believe it or not, what you're looking at right there is a single board game experience. Someone took all these board games and made one set of rules for how you play all of them in a big connected sequence. There is a lot of innate complexity. Learning the rules takes quite some time there. As opposed to a game like Go, which is a very complex game, but not innately. The complexity is emergent because of the clever way that the centers and the patterns push up against each other. One of the best ways to build towards that kind of simplicity is to give things multiple purposes. Again, going back to Pac-Man, because I, I just love Pac-Man so much, the dots in Pac-Man, they seem so simple. They, they just, like, they're just dots. Who cares? But when you count up their purposes, they, there's many of them. First, they're your goal. Eat all the dots on the level. So now my game for, they've established my goal for the game. They give me points, and points are my judgment of how good I am at the game. They create a pleasing sound of progress. Waka, waka, waka every time I eat a dot. No waka, waka when I don't eat dots. So you get this kind of nice feedback loop of progress. This is how I get extra lives. I've got to eat dots to get points. Points get me extra lives. To, so in order to survive in the game, the dots make me survive. And where's the progress meter? I don't need a progress meter. The dots simply, at a glance, show me my progress. I don't, I don't need it. They're, they've solved that purpose. And then they have a secret purpose very few people know about. Every time you eat a dot in Pac-Man, it slows you down just a little bit. It kicks you back just a little bit. And that's enough and to make you go just a little slower down a dot hallway than an empty hallway. And guess what? What speed do the ghosts go? The ghosts go a little slower than you in an empty hallway and a little faster than you in a dot hallway. So suddenly you have this very interesting strategic decision to make. The final pattern is not separateness, okay? What does that mean? Well, it, he, he's talking about things being connected to each other in a fundamental way. I love this picture, this picture he has of a path made of these stones connected together. And of course, so many of the patterns are seen here. You see the stones are connected to the earth, but all the stones are actually the same. 
they're not different stones. They're just turned at an angle. They're all the same square. So you have this perfect echo along them. And then you have alternating repetition, and then you have a gradient, and you have everything here. Everything is connected. And one of my, one of my favorite games in this regard is Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons. Um, this is just a gorgeous, beautiful game, and it's so clever. The idea of it is these two brothers go on an adventure, and you're going to control both of them. And you do one with each one of your hands. One hand controls one brother, one hand controls the other brother. And you solve a lot of interesting puzzles and things by moving these two brothers together. Now, of course, this works with the human neurology because one hand is controlled by one half of the brain, the other hand is controlled by the other half of the brain. And the only way they communicate is up the middle, up the, little, up the corpus callosum there. And so it's almost like the two halves of the brain, which sort of behave like siblings, now actually get to be siblings in the game. And then now I'm going to give a spoiler, cover your ears and sing if you, if you really don't want to know. Something bad happens to one of the brothers. And you'll never feel so alone in your life when suddenly that brother is gone because half of your brain is now unable to participate in the game. And then cleverly, what happens next in the game is so beautiful that I think it will make anyone cry. And so it's a great example of deep interlock between the player's story and the game story, but it takes it farther. It's not just the, the, the explicit story and the game story, but it goes actually into the psychology and even the neurology of the player. And there's this beautiful connectedness and non-separateness that happens between all three of these things. And for me, this is why games that aren't just fun, but games that actually change us as people, games that educate, games that transform, are so important. Because great games, they change us, and they make us better at connecting with each other, and they make us better connect, at connecting with the entire world, which is kind of the ultimate in non-separateness. So there's the patterns. There's the 15 patterns. Um, we've only really scratched the surface talking about them. I hope you find some utility in thinking about them. I hope you find them useful. And of course, we've only scratched the surface of the works of Christopher Alexander. Um, so I hope you'll check out some of his works. There's so much to learn about there. Now, at the beginning, I said that even though Alexander is obscure now, that he would be famous in the future, I'd like to make a prediction about how that will happen. I think the way it will happen is through AI, because AIs are designed to make the world a better place, and AIs love patterns. Now, very soon, all of you will be working closely with AIs, because AIs are going to be such an important part of game narrative in the near future. And so don't be too surprised when a few years from now, when you're training up some AI to kind of be a character in one of your games, the AI is like, hey, human, have you noticed these 15 patterns that make everything better? And you can be like, yeah, robot, I know. That's how we made you. Thanks.